This lesson carries on from lesson 3b. Here's where we're going to look at uh, gases. This is really important for anyone wanting to understand human physiology, metabolism, anesthesia, and just generally loads of stuff related to being the healthiest and, and best looking person that you can be. Gases are all around us, from the oxygen we breathe in to the carbon dioxide we exhale. To understand how gases behave in different situations, like inside a container, or in our lungs, or dissolved in blood, we use gas laws. These laws describe the relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, and number of gas molecules. So what creates, what creates gas pressure? Well, gas pressure comes from gas molecules moving rapidly and colliding with the walls of a container. And the movement is random. And we call this diffusion, where they spread, spread apart and, and, and fill that container. For example, imagine you're in bed and your partner farts. And this fart goes to an area of high concentration just outside their anus to fill the entire room at a much lower concentration. That's the fart diffusing. Imagine balls bouncing inside a box. Each collision exerts a small force in the box from the inside to the outside. And the combined effect of all collisions creates the pressure we measure or feel. More molecules or faster movement, at higher temperature is another way of saying faster movement, means more collisions, which increases pressure. Less space, smaller volume of container, increases the frequency of collisions on the container, which also raises pressure. You can imagine this yourself, right? Imagine a gas in a balloon. If the gas is hotter, the balloon is more likely to be shaking and then pop because the number of collisions on the inside of the balloon. Now imagine a balloon of gas that then gets smaller because you squeeze it. You can tell straight away that the pressure in, in, inside the balloon goes up because you can feel that pressure in your hand while you're doing the squeezing. But what are the properties that define gas behavior? Well, gases can be described by essentially just four key properties, which we're going to go through now. The first one is pressure, P the force exerted by gas molecules on the walls of a container. Second one is volume, V. This is the space the gas takes up. The third is temperature, T. It's how much kinetic energy or speed the individual molecules have. And the fourth is the quantity of gas molecules, N, lowercase. And the number of gas molecules often measured in, in moles, which is a unit we'll cover later on in the course. You don't need to worry about it for now. These properties interact in, in very predictable ways, which we explore through gas laws. Gases which obey these laws perfectly are called ideal gases, but in reality, each, each gas only obeys them roughly or approximately. And the first one I'm going to go through is Boyle's law. It shows us a relationship between pressure and volume. So at constant temperature, the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume. So more pressure, less volume less volume, more pressure, just like squeezing a gas into a smaller space. You know, think of squeezing a balloon, i.e. reducing the volume, and the pressure inside increases. So let's have an example in action. So if you look at, let's say, ventilation in the lungs, right, um, that follows Boyle's law. When the diaphragm contracts and pulls down, the lung volume increases, lowering the pressure inside, allowing air to flow in, because air goes to an area of high pressure outside to an area of low pressure in the lungs. The second law is Charles's law. It relates temperature and volume together. So at constant pressure, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature. So if you double the temperature, you double the volume of the gas, assuming pressure is constant. So here's an analogy. An analogy. If you heat a balloon, i.e. you increase temperature, then the balloon will expand. In medicine, we see this all the time. Gas volumes in, in medical devices or oxygen tanks, they have to account for changes in temperature to ensure there's accurate delivery to patients. If the tank changes temperature, depending on where it is, you don't want that to mean too little or too much oxygen goes to the patient. The third law is Gay-Lussac's law. This one relates pressure and temperature together. So what does this mean? It means 
at constant volume, the pressure of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature. So more temperature, more pressure on the container uh, because more molecules are hitting the inside of the container. They're moving around more, so more collisions, more pressure with more temperature. Uh, you can think of you know heating a closed can of a fizzy drink. If you heat it, then pressure will build up inside. If you heat it enough, there's so much pressure, the can can explode. What about in medicine? Well, in hyperbaric chambers, temperature changes can affect pressure, which then influences the oxygen delivery to the tissues. So if any of you have ever seen hyperbaric oxygen therapy, then that entire treatment depends on this particular gas law to work. The fourth law is Avogadro's law. And this is how we relate volume and number of gas molecules. So at constant pressure and temperature, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules. So add more gas molecules, you'll need a bigger container if you want the pressure to still be the same. Easy analogy. Blow more air into a balloon, i.e. more gas molecules placed inside the balloon, then it expands its volume and it stays the same pressure. Now, in the respiratory system, this law explains how gas exchange in the lungs works as adding air increases lung volume during breathing in, just like breathing in, blowing into a balloon makes that bigger. Now, the fifth law is the important one. It's called the ideal gas law. It brings all the previous laws into one equation, PV equals nRT, where R is a universal gas constant. Now, this law shows that the physical properties of pressure, volume, temperature, and quantity of molecules are all linked. They're all linked in such a way that if you know three of the letters in the equation, you can work out the fourth. And the equation is the same, regardless of which gas you're studying as well. But remember that only ideal gases obey it perfectly. Most gases just follow it mm, closely instead of exactly. And this equation allows anesthesiologists to calculate the delivery of gases like nitrogen oxide based on temperature, pressure, and volume. In medicine, though, we never really have gases on their own in most circumstances. There's usually a mix like oxygen and carbon dioxide together or the air around us, which is always a mix of gases too. And this is why we look at things like partial pressures. See, in a mixture of gases, like air in the lungs or the atmosphere, each gas exerts its own partial pressure or proportional to its concentration. The total pressure of the whole gas mixture is the sum of all partial pressures of each gas in the mix. In other words, the total number of collisions on the inside of the container is the number of collisions that each gas is making happen individually. So to put it even simpler, if there are two gases in a mixture, we can say that the partial pressure of each one is five units. So the total pressure of the whole mixture is 10 units. Simple. Partial pressure is key in oxygen transport. You see the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs drives its diffusion into the blood, enabling gas exchange. It's also what drives carbon dioxide out of the blood and into the lungs so we can breathe it out. Pause here if you need a minute to really understand the diagram that's now on screen. We have to address the elephant in the room now. In order for our cells to survive, gases have to be soluble because most of them have their gas supplies from the bloodstream. So to really have the right knowledge so that we can take control of our own health and lifestyle, I'm gonna go through briefly the knowledge for understanding how gas solubility actually works. And this is called Henry's Law. I know there's a lot of names here. I might have even got some of them wrong, so correct me if I have. But Henry's Law states that the amount of gas that dissolves in a liquid is directly proportional to the gas's partial pressure above that other liquid is dissolved in. In simpler terms, the higher the concentration of a gas in the air or the space above the liquid, the more of that gas will move into and dissolve into the liquid. So here's the formula for Henry's law, it's C equals Kp. C is the, the concentration of the gas dissolved in the liquid. Uh, K is, uh, lowercase k is a constant that depends on the type of gas and liquid combination you have. Uh, you know, some gases dissolve better than others. 
and P is the partial pressure of the gas hovering above the liquid. So let's break it down with an analogy. Imagine a can of Coke or something. The can contains carbon dioxide gas dissolved in the liquid. Before you open it, the gas is in high pressure in the bottle. And this high pressure forces a lot of CO2 to move into the liquid and dissolve. When you open the can, the pressure above the liquid drops because the liquid is exposed to the whole room now. And CO2 escapes as bubbles because the liquid can't hold as much gas at lower pressure. This is Henry's law in action. More gas dissolves under higher pressure and less gas dissolves under lower pressure. Now let's relate this to your body and medicine. Oxygen in blood is a great example, right? In your lungs, oxygen from the air is in contact with the liquid in your blood, in your lungs. Because the partial pressure of oxygen is higher in your lung air than in your blood, oxygen dissolves into the blood. That's the first step in delivering oxygen to your tissues like during exercise. Carbon dioxide removal is another good example. The reverse happens with that. The partial pressure of CO2 is higher in your blood than in your lung air. So CO2 moves out of the blood and into the air in your lungs where we breathe it out. Now there are medical applications of Henry's law as well. So this is what you see sometimes in some longevity clinics that haven't got a clue what they're doing most of the time. So if you think of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which I mentioned earlier, in this treatment, you know, patients breathe oxygen at a higher pressure than normal. According to Henry's law, this increases the amount of oxygen, then that will dissolve into the blood, which can speed up wound healing or help treat conditions like carbon monoxide poisoning or alleviate oxygen deprivation when dermal fillers block blood vessels. Scuba diving is another good application, right? Divers face very unique challenges with Henry's law. At, at much deeper depths, the pressure under the sea is much higher, and that forces more nitrogen to dissolve into their blood. And if they come up too quickly, the pressure drops too rapidly, and the nitrogen can come out too quick of solution as bubbles, which causes decompression sickness. I think they call it the bends. Now, if they come up slowly, then they give the nitrogen a chance to come out without bubbling, and it can be just breathed out safely. Henry's law is the foundation for understanding how gases behave in liquids. Whether it's oxygen dissolving in your blood to keep you alive, or understanding how to safely scuba dive, this principle shows how pressure affects gas exchange and solubility. In medicine, it's key to managing breathing treatments, you know, oxygen therapy, and even anesthesia delivery. All the gas laws matter in medicine, though, not just Henry's. And, you know, the, the, this isn't theoretical, right? It, this, this guides practical applications in looking after your health. In ventilation, we can understand the pressure and volume uh, helps in, in mechanical ventilation and, and managing lung diseases. In oxygen delivery, Henry's law and, and partial pressures explain oxygen therapy and gas exchange within the lungs. In anesthesia, Gas laws are crucial for delivering the right amounts of anesthetic gases to the patient so they stay asleep for the operation. So by understanding how gases behave under different conditions, we can optimize treatments that rely on a delicate balance of pressure, volume, temperature in the body. And then you'll better understand how your body performs in exercise too. Many people talk about VO2 max being a really important metric for how healthy someone is. Well, VO2 max is a function of all the laws we've just discussed here, as well as other things. Now, in the next lesson, I'm going to go through the concept of chemical quantity. If you understand this, you can calculate concentrations of things like nutrients, supplements, and drugs to work out the exact dose required for specific applications. That one will, I th will be in the paid school group, I think, um, where I can teach you a whole lot more. They're just a pre-made video with things like live teaching and group discussions where we go through each lesson again and also apply it to our day-to-day -day lives like in the gym or supermarket or in the hospital. So hopefully I'll see you there.